man, what a privilege and what an honor. I don't take it lightly uh, to stand before God's people. I've got eternity in mind. I know this day is being recorded in heaven. And whatever I say, I'll be held accountable. I pray that the Lord will give me utterance that I will not go before myself or run ahead of myself and say things that are irrelevant in this pulpit because I've got the realization. I know that one day I am going to stand before God and give an account. He's counted me worthy to stand be before God's people today and I don't take it lightly. First and foremost, I just want to thank the leadership of this church, saying thank you so much for the entrustment. I'm humbled. Amen. Pastor Nelly, you know I love you. Amen. Great woman of God. Amen. What you see is what you get. Hallelujah. No beating about the bush, and I love people like that. Hallelujah. It, I like real people. Amen. I love you. And uh, greetings from my husband. He's in um, Kisumu this morning, speaking at the Voice of Salvation and Healing. And he sends his love to you. Amen. I just feel so blessed to be in church again. Two years ago, I was with the youth in church. And uh, today's youth service, I'm so passionate about the youth. Amen. I just felt so excited when I was being told, you're preaching on Sunday, and it's youth service. I thought, wow, youth service again, because my passion is for the youth. You know, when even this conference, we we're admonishing the women to rise up and see the bigger picture, to pray for our children, to intercede for them, because the, the youth are the future for tomorrow. And if we bruise them, if we break them, if we bend them in such a way that they become like a boomerang. You know, who knows a boomerang? When you throw out a boomerang, it comes back right at you. If we bend them so much, they'll come back hitting at us as their parents. May God give us the wisdom. May God help us to stand in the gap for the youth of Africa. Amen. We are being exposed now to these ethnic differences. Where people are standing up and saying, I'm a Kikuyu, I'm a Kamba, I'm a Luo, you know, I'm a Kalenjin. And some of these youths are being caught up in families where the mother is a Kikuyu, the father is a Luo, and, or the mother is a Kamba, the father is, you know, a Luya. And they're so confused because there's tensions in the house. I've heard of horror stories where families have been uh, separated. And I cry out. Since I heard about the ethnic fightings in uh, Kisumu, even some areas here in Nairobi and some parts of the country, where there's been so much infightings, where families have been split, wives have had to be separated from their husbands, and the youth are the ones that have been found, you know, in the cold because they don't know which side to belong to because my mother is a Kikuyu, so I, should I follow the Kikuyu or should I be a Luo, you know? It's very, very disturbing when it comes to the youth for me. It's a passion because I cry for the youth of Africa. I see all the miseries. I see the youth running to other countries and some of them have ended up in slavery in those other countries. I see our girls being cheated of jobs overseas, and they found themselves in prostitution. These are the realities that we are facing as Africans. I pray that the leaders of this continent will come to the realization that we've got a task before us and help our youth because they are our future. Amen. Today's twigs, today's small trees will be tomorrow's forest. And if we don't tend to them, we put fire to them, we are not going to have a future. Or if we let our youths just go haywire, because as a church, we're supposed to stand in the gap and pray for our youth. We have to realize that 
The enemy wants to destroy this land because the youth are going to be tomorrow's future. And if we are going to have leaders that have got damaged brains because they were so much exposed to drugs, what kind of leadership are we going to have in the tomorrow? Church, we are the salt of the earth, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5. We are the salt of the earth. Let's bring season to our children. We are the light of the world. Let's bring light to our children. I'm so passionate about the youth. Even when in my intercession times, I cry for the youth of today. I cry for those that are being taken into slavery. I, tr I cry for, your, for the youths that have been cheated of jobs out there only to find themselves incarcerated and also enslaved by their slave masters. I cry for the youth, especially the girls, that have been traffic trafficked into prostitution. They've been promised their jobs out there only to find that the jobs that they were talking about is prostitution. I've, had, I've um, done a research, it's a study that I did as well, about how girls are being trafficked into prostitution, being promised about jobs that are not even available out there. Youth, be aware. Do your research before you start preparing your passports to go out there only to find yourselves in hot soup. Um, my favorite scripture is Psalms 127. Psalms 127, verse 3 to 5. The Bible reads, Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring, a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents. You know, I, I was speaking to the women the other day about us speaking well about our children because we have to realize that these children are arrows in our hands. We can bend them, we can break them, or we can speak well of them and encourage them and motivate them to do mighty exploits whilst they are still small. We are the ones that are, have got the ability, they are in our hands. You know, like a, a small tree, when it's growing up, you can actually bend it in the way that you want it to go. But when it's grown, it reaches a certain stage when you try to bend it, it will break. So please, parents, do not waste your time by saying, ah, I'll speak to them when they are grown up. The time to speak to them is now. Where you can where you can train them. You can either break them or you can twist them so badly thinking I'm disciplining them. You speak to them harshly because you're thinking I am making them focused. In the meantime, you're making them so twisted. As, an, as a warrior, you try to send that arrow into the society. It comes boomeranging at you. It comes to devastate you. It comes back right at you and it hits you back. And most parents are experiencing that today in their lives. If you are such a parent, I'm asking, I'm praying that God will just help you. That you may come to that point where you've broken your children down so badly that they don't even know which way to go. They have no vision. They've been so demoralized that when they go out there in the society, all you hear is sad news because they go out there as a devastation not as a light, not as a salt. But I pray that as parents, we'll be able to sharpen these arrows that God has given us according to Psalms 127. I like a family that is talked about in the book of Genesis. I always look at this family. At first you get angry. At first you, you know, you, and then you just get so disappointed why was this man behaving like this? Why did this woman not realize that this was an attack from the enemy and took her stand to protect her family? In Genesis chapter 29, the Bible talks about 
the Jacob family. How that there was so much confusion. I like the Bible. It's all in the word. It's all in the Bible. You know, it hasn't hidden anything from us. In Genesis chapter 29. Starting from verse 21. We being, the Bible is describing to us. A family that started out with so much. They were hoping for the, Jacob was hoping for the best. And then when he realized that he had a road deal, I'm going to paraphrase that scripture. When he realized that he had a road deal from his family, from his father-in-law, he became angry. He was given a woman that he did not love right from the word go. And this woman knew that she wasn't loved. But where did she take her anger to? She directed, she directed her anger to her children. You might find yourself as a mother or as a father where you're feeling unloved. And instead of directing that anger to something else, you direct it towards your offsprings. And you become so angry. You twist them so badly such that, you know, these children start doing certain things in society that they are not supposed to have started doing in the first place. But they find themselves in a state of confusion. They find themselves in a state of not wanting, way, not knowing which way to go. They find themselves in a predicament, like what's happening today. Parents, I'm warning you, you are harming your children. If you're going to be fighting in front of them, because you belong to two parties, you're bringing devastation to your own children. Because when they, when they start acting out, you wonder where they got it from. In the meantime, you would have long forgotten what you say to your wife in front of them. You would have long forgotten what you did to your wife or what you did to your husband in front of them. There's a story that's been told of this young boy who went to school and came back home. And whilst the mother was preparing, uh, he had, she had made him breakfast so that he could eat quickly and she was going to take him to school. And apparently this child was just looking into the Bible, you know, flipping the pages. And uh, the mother says, hey, Eat your breakfast. It's a little boy. Eat your breakfast. You're going to be late. What are you looking for anyway? Why aren't you eating your breakfast but you keep on searching the Bible? This little boy answered the mother and says, oh, Mom, are there two Jesuses in this world? The mother turned around without even paying attention to find out exactly what the child meant. He says, what are you talking about? Who told you that there are two Jesuses? He tried to explain that our teacher, she stopped him immediately without listening to the finishing of the sentence. Our teacher says, oh, is that what your teacher is teaching you now? He's teaching you heresy. So I'm going to go to your school and I am going to speak to this teacher. And the child was just left in the latch. The child was just left in the cold without, sure, he wasn't given a chance to explain himself. This teacher was very upset. Uh, this mother was very upset and went straight to the school, stormed into the principal's office, and she asked the principal to have this teacher brought to the office. And she was so angry. She says, I want this, this teacher to be expelled from the school. He, she can't be teaching us that there's another Jesus. So when the teacher was called in, she started attacking him without even giving him a chance. What is this heresy that you're teaching our children? Why are you saying to them that there's another form of Jesus? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. So they caught the little boy this time around. Did you, did you say to your mother that there were two Jesuses? He said, yes. Did, did, you, did you hear from, the, from your teacher about this Jesus, that there were two Jesuses? He, say, he started explaining that no. The teacher told us about this Jesus who's loving, this Jesus who's kind, this Jesus who's compassionate. But when I go home, I see my mother singing about this Jesus and loving this Jesus. But every time, she's always shouting. She's always, if she even steals my money from my dad. Now, if she loves this Jesus, if this is the same Jesus that my teacher has been speaking about, then there must be two of them. So what are, you, what are you teaching your children? Are you in church lifting up your hands? And when you go home, you're a different person. 
Because children don't do what you tell them. Children do what they see. So be very careful about the arrows in your hands. You might be bending them. You might be forming them into something that will come back hitting at you. Amen. What do you do as a youth when you find yourself in a situation like that? The Bible narrates a story about the Jacob family. These boys were naughty. These boys did all kinds of things. If we look at Genesis chapter 34, verse 25, look at these boys. They saw their parents arguing. They saw their mother very bitter. They saw their mother that their mother was unloved. And in the meantime, that didn't stop them from growing. They were growing every day. And they were gleaning truths about life, they, what they termed as truths about life. They might have been found in a large way. They just felt everything is meaningless. Everything is senseless. Genesis chapter 34, verse 25 Three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. These were angry men. Let's see it playing out. This is now the scenery. We read about it, how they, were, they grew up in a confused kind of background. Then all of a sudden, they find themselves... You know, growing up angry. Fine. Their sister was raped. If you look, the, look at the background, their sister was raped. And they became so angry that they went and killed all the men in the city. And it brought grief to their father. Because these boys were just angry boys. You might find yourself very angry as a youth. Wanting vengeance out there because of the background where you're coming from. You don't even know why you're angry. You just walk around angry. You're just an angry person. You're always shouting at other people. What do you do as a youth when you find yourself in a situation like that? Genesis chapter 34 verse 21. Uh, let's try um, 35 verse 21. And 22, uh, okay. Israel moved again and pitched his tent beyond Megdal. Verse 22. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in, slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard of it. Jacob had 12 sons. This is one of Israel's children. He went in and slept with his father's concubine. What do you think would make a child do a thing like that? Hitting back at his parents. When they killed the men in Shechem, Jacob had to move. Now this time around, he pitched his tent somewhere else and his son, Reuben, went and slept with his father's concubine. Those days they had many wives. They had concubines as well. He went in and slept with his father's concubine. What would make a child do that? It's anger. It's unforgiveness. He might have a grudge against the father. He might have lost respect for his father. And he was trying to hit back at the father where it pained the most. So be careful, parents, what you're doing to your children today. Because you might twist them so badly that they come back hitting back at you. You throw that arrow into society and it goes round and comes back and hits at you. Reuben must have seen that his mother was unloved. Reuben must have seen the arguments that was going on in the Jacob family. And when he was grown up enough where he couldn't be disciplined anymore, he, he did just what he felt. You know, the anger. He had to do it. He had to play it out. This is what happened to Reuben. Genesis 37 verse 19 These are children that grew up in a very dysfunctional home. What do you do as a youth when you find yourself in a dysfunctional home where your parents are always arguing 
And then they drag themselves to church. And then they lift up holy hands when the pastor says, or the song leader tells people to lift up their holy hands. They're the first ones to lift up their holy hands. What are you saying to your children? They are observing you. They are looking at you. What are you saying to your children? Genesis 37 verse 19. We'll go reading downwards. Um, here comes the dreamer. They said, Jacob had sent his son to go and take supplies to his brothers that were in the field, tending the ship. And the Bible says that when they saw him coming, they said, here comes the dreamer. Uh, verse 20. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes out of his dreams. Joseph was a very ambitious young man. He went around sharing his dreams to his brothers. He was a love child because he was a love child. Jacob loved Rachel so well, so much, that these boys noticed. He even made him a coat of many colors. This boy might have been going around, you know, feeling, you know, I'm the loved one. I've got a coat of many colors. And he was announcing it to his, to his brothers. And he would tell them about the dreams of what God has already spoken to him in his dreams. And when they saw him, they said, let's kill him. Dysfunctional home, eh? Do you want your children to kill each other after you're gone? Do you want your children to start scheming against each other? Because that's the thing that they have seen in their homes, as they are in their home, as they have been growing up. Do you want your children to be dysfunctional? Because you as a couple are dysfunctional. Now, as a youth, what do you do? When you find yourself in a dysfunctional home, there's also a, uh, another story. You know, okay, let's read Genesis chapter 49 from the verse 3 to 8. Jacob is about to go. He's on his deathbed. You know. He's on his deathbed. He's giving his last testament. He's giving his children. He's telling them that he's about to go. And what will become of them. Maybe we, we can start from verse 1. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around me so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, son, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, exhaling in honor, exhaling in power. Turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel, for you went out up in, onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and you defiled it. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they passed. That's how angry these boys are. Where? They maimed animals just for fun. They went out there, you know, to see an animal fall because they've broken its bones. That's how angry they are. And some of our youth are so angry that they just want to cause harm. They want to go out there and fight with their friends for no apparent reason. Somebody just, you know, touches him like that. He, all of a sudden, there's anger that flares up. Why? There's a background. There's a reason why that person is like that. Verse 7. Cursed be their anger. So fierce. Their fury. So cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob. Disperse them in Israel. Judah. Your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Why did he bless Judah? If we had read the preceding verses from uh, Genesis chapter 29, uh, we could have noticed that when Leah realized that this man that she was trying to coax, this man that she was trying to entice to be her own, to belong to mine and mine truly, 
you know, was not actually paying attention to her. She actually changed her mind. She said, there's no need for me to go on like this. There's no need for me to continue and trying to entice this man. This man's heart is not with me. She turned her heart back to the Lord. Hallelujah. She turned her heart back to the Lord. And she said, now I will praise you. I will sing praises to you because you are, you are my God. You are the one who has given me this marriage. Yes, even though this man does not love me, yet I will not conform to his standards. I will praise you. I will go a step higher. What do, you what do you do when you find yourself in a situation like that? Please, parents, let's not provoke our children. Let's not provoke our children to anger. Let's not provoke our children to a point where they boomerang on us. And children, I'm speaking to the youth. The Bible says, obey your parents. It's the only commandment that comes with a promise. It's the only commandment that comes with a promise. The Bible here is not giving us a condition. It's not saying that obey your parents when they're good to you. Obey your parents when they're not fighting. You have to reposition yourself. This is about your life. This is the battle of your life as a youth. This is the battle of your life as a child. Exodus 20 verse 12. This is the only commandment that comes with a promise. Exodus chapter 20 verse 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land. The Lord your God is giving you. So if you honor your parents, despite their dysfunctionality, you know, despite their dysfunctional relationship, you know your mother is not loved. You know your, your mother doesn't love your father. And they're just together. And some of them say that I'm just in this marriage because of children. And they've gone, carried on living like that, not knowing that they're destroying the very people that they're staying into that marriage for. We are told about a certain young man called David in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11. You know, David has been anointed as king over Israel. Nobody ever knows about it. But this young man, you know, grew up in a family where I believe he was unloved. Because the book of Psalms says that even though my father and my mother forget me, yet the Lord will never forget me. He knew that he was unloved. Even when Samuel came to anoint, if you read uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 16, we're not going to go there because of time. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 1. The Bible is talking about you know, how Samuel was told to go and anoint one of Jake, um, Jesse's sons. And when he got there, Jesse didn't even call David. He was forgotten. He was made to go and tend for the sheep. And when in verse, six, uh, verse uh, 11, so he asked Jesse, are these, are, are these all the sons you have? Because the Lord told him, no, 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 no. It's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this one. And, you know, some of the people, they even got confused as a man of God because of their stature. They looked anointed. They looked like they had a stately um, structure. They thought, yeah, this must be the man. This must be the leader. Even the man of God was misled. And the Lord was telling him, nope, pass on. This is not the one. Go to the next person. You know, we're going to look at this life of David who felt so rejected, who was banished to look after the sheep. So he asked, are these all your sons you have? They is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Jess, uh, jo, uh, David found himself in a position of rejection. You might be feeling dis, de dejected and rejected in the family that you have been brought up into. You might be feeling ostracized from your family members. But listen to this, this young man called David. He never gave up and he never gave in. He didn't care what his family thought of him. He didn't care 
what society said about him. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Even when Samuel came, we've read in the scriptures, he says, we'll not sit down until this boy comes. And when he came in, he had to be anointed in front of his brothers, the person that they had undermined, the person that they had looked down on. That's what the Lord was making even behind the backyard of Jesse's yard in the wilderness, exposed to all kinds of danger that could have taken his life. He was exposed to all kinds of danger. Hallelujah. He was exposed to all kinds of danger. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 34 to 37, David had been trained. In that backyard, he was being trained. He was being hardened. In that place where you feel rejected, encourage yourself in the Lord because you are in the training. God has got something. I'm speaking to the youth today. God is training you for something great. Do not look at your misery. If you are coming from a background, by the way, my, the title of my message, I beg your pardon, is entitled Broken Arrows. Arrows that have been broken. Broken down by their parents. They have been broken by you know, society. Sometimes even by friends because of bad company. They've been broken down. I'm talking to those broken arrows that feel rejected, that feel like they are outcasts in society, that feel that they are outcasts even within their families. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 uh, to 37, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's ship. When a lion came or a bear came and carried off a ship from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the ship from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the power of the lion... And the power of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So say to David, go and the Lord be with you. Hallelujah. It's in those moments, you know, where you have been fearful. Where some things have been coming against you. And there's been no help because you're alone in that moment. David is narrating to Saul. As the children of Israel were being threatened by this giant called Goliath. He said... He had confidence in the Lord because it's in those quiet moments, it's in those moments of rejection that he learned to encourage himself in the Lord, that the Lord took him out of the pits of depression. He did not desire to abide in there. It was in those moments in the wilderness that he had an encounter with the Lord. You might be feeling as a youth that you've been rejected. You have been ostracized from your family. You might be feeling that like that because your parents are forever fighting and you're feeling like you're a mistake. You're feeling rejected. You're feeling ostracized and you're saying, God, where, where, where are you in a moment like that? You might be coming from your home where maybe the whole night you didn't even sleep properly because your parents fought the whole night. Encourage yourself in the Lord this morning. Because it's in those moments that the Lord is raising you up. It's in those moments where the Lord is making you. It's in those depressive moments that you can encourage yourself in the Lord. David, many times, he found himself saying, Why art thou downcast, O my soul? When your soul feels downcast, re encourage yourself in the Lord. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Rejoice in the Lord, for I'll yet praise him. When you have felt rejected, when your parents have said, and instead of prophesying positive things over you, they've called you all kinds of things. You're a failure. You're a fool. You amount to nothing because they've said it out of anger. Reject those words from your spirits. Arise above that situation. Arise above that circumstance. And say like David, why art thou downcast on my soul? Rejoice in the Lord, for I will yet praise him. Hallelujah. You don't have to remain down there as a youth. Hallelujah. David says, I was young and now I'm old. 
but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. No, their seed begging for bread. You might be young out there, but if you continue to encourage yourself in the Lord, if you've got the right standing with God, God is going to be with you all the way. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll be there with you. You will know that even the strength that I have to overcome this obstacle has been because God has been on my side. Hallelujah. You will not succumb to any situation that is depressing. You arise above the circumstance. That's what you do as a child of God. That's what you do as a believer. A person who has come to know the Lord as their Lord and Savior. He is there with you. Even in that dark moment. In that wilderness where there are things that are frightening you. Where there are things that can devour you. Where suicidal thoughts have come to you and said, what is the meaning of life? Meaningless. Senseless. Everything seems to be vain. Everything doesn't seem to make sense at all. Encourage yourself in the Lord. David could have succumbed to that kind of situation of depression, of always being rejected. If you read, please read, go, go home and read, study the life of David. You find that even his brothers, when he went to give them supply and he heard Goliath making threats against the children of Israel, he was able to stand and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defile the armies of God? You know, when his brother overheard him saying that, he says, you know what? What are you doing here anyway? Who sent you here? We know you. You know, just go back and look after the ship. Who, are, who sent you here? And who have you left the ship with? Despite that he went to give them supplies, something to refresh them. Yet he turned around harshly and rebuked him. But David did not listen to him because he knew who he was. He had found out in that wilderness that God was his strength. And this, one, this uncircumcised Philistine was going to be one of them. Like the lions and the bears that came and attacked him. Hallelujah. He had the confidence in the Lord. It was in that wilderness. It was in that moment, in those days of loneliness. When he felt like he was being rejected even by his very own. That he wrote beautiful psalms that we are able to recite today. Even in our times where he writes the book of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It was in moments of danger. Don't think he was sitting somewhere where it was all quiet. There were threats all over him. There were lions, there were bears. There were dangerous snakes in that wilderness that would have killed his life. That would have killed him. But he wrote those beautiful psalms thousands of years ago that we're able to find comfort in. Hallelujah. As a youth, if you find yourself in a situation like that, I'm asking you to arise above the situation. Hallelujah. Do not be a devastation to your parents. Do not be a devastation to society. Do not go around impregnating other girls because you don't have respect for girls. Do not go do that. Be like David in those moments. Have a personal relationship with God. Find out who this God is. Do not have suicidal thoughts. But encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. Isaiah chapter 61. From verse 1 to 10. The Bible reads, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to, for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. If you have found yourself in a prison, you feel like your house is a prison, God is here to release you. Jesus is here to release you. Amen. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort those who mourn. To provide for those who, give, who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Hallelujah. If you are in the right standing with God, he will give you beauty for ashes. Hallelujah. Instead of walking bowed down, with, instead of walking 
with eyes that are full of sorrow. Every time somebody looks at you, they'll know that something is wrong with this child or something this is wrong with this young man. Something is wrong with this young woman. Know that the Lord is going to give you beautiful ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. You come out of those homes mourning. God is going to give you the oil of gladness instead of mourning. You will be able to rejoice in the Lord. You will not say, why art thou downcast on the Lord, O my soul? Hallelujah. But you will say to your soul, rejoice in the Lord. But for I will yet praise him. And he will give you that gladness instead of mourning. And the garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. They will be called ox of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. This might be a generational curse because your father saw his mother, his father beating up his mother. He gets married to your mother and he starts building up your, your mother as well. The Bible says that they will, you will rebuild the ancient ruins. The back stops on you. You will not go out there and devastate. Your father has copied from his father. But you will be a rebuilder of ancient ruins. Hallelujah. And restore the places long devastated. You know that this thing is dysfunctional. And sometimes you might even be discouraged. You might be saying, hmm, marriage doesn't work. You don't even want to get married. Because you have, from your parents, looking at your parents' lives, if you say, this is what marriage is all about, then I don't want to have anything to do with it. You will, if we can go back to verse 4, please. You will uh, restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities. You will renew the ruined cities as a child of God, as a youth, even as a father. If you found yourself gravitating towards beating your wife, or as a woman, you find yourself, you know, being gravitated to insulting your husband because you found you, your mother used to insult your father. And there's just no love in this house. You are, going to re you are going to restore, renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. The back stops on you. If you can go to verse 5, please. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations. And in their cities, you will boast. Hallelujah. This is, a, this is a prophecy to you. Hallelujah. This is a prophecy to you. If you decide to rejoice in the Lord, this is what is going to happen to you. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, and we, we, they will rejoice. They, inherit, uh, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so will they inherit and so they will inherit the double portion in their land. And everlasting joy will be, will be theirs. Hallelujah. Everlasting joy will be yours. If you decide to rejoice in the Lord. If like David being placed in the wilderness, you know, even though he knew that his father and mother might have forgotten him, yet the Lord will never forget you. If you come to that realization that the Lord has not forgotten you, I pray that prayer for you, that you'll come to that realization and rejoice in the Lord. Verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make them an everlasting covenant with me. The Lord will make an everlasting covenant with you. Hallelujah. Verse 9. For I, their descendants will be known among the nations and their offsprings among the peoples, all those who see them will acknowledge that they are people the Lord has blessed. Hallelujah. Some of you can testify to that. Some of you can testify what the Lord has done in your lives. You will know that the Lord, this has been the doing of the Lord. This has not been because of my parents. Because if I had to align myself with the, as a Kikuyu, or if I had to align myself as a Kamba, but I aligned myself with God. 
you'll be able to rejoice. Hallelujah. You'll be called the blessed of the Lord. We are of a different culture. Hallelujah. Verse, verse 9, verse 10. I delight greatly in, my Lord, in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For, for, as, the soil makes this, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and the garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. Hallelujah. This is a prophecy to you. Hallelujah. If you align yourself like David did, you will be like that. The sovereign Lord, the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. Hallelujah. For as the soil makes the soil, as the soil makes the sprout come to come up and the garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Hallelujah. I pray this prayer before you. I speak that word before you. And I prophesy that word over your lives. Those that are feeling devastated, those that are feeling unloved, I pray that the Lord will comfort you. Hallelujah. And uh, if we can go to Isaiah 42 verse 3. God is saying that a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. Hallelujah. You might be feeling bruised this morning. You, must be, you might be feeling, you know, suffocated. Like Pastor Terry was saying, do not let anyone reduce your oxygen. You know, when you go in the house, you don't know whether you should breathe hard or breathe little. Because the situation is so tense in the house that you're thinking, hey, if I do anything or if I look in my father's direction, he'll just blow up on me. He will not. Do not let him reduce your oxygen. Breathe freely because God has given us this oxygen freely. He will, God will not break you. He says a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. If you're feeling bruised, if you're feeling like your light is being snuffed out, where you're just feeling so depressive, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. The Lord wants to give you rest this morning. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your circumstance is. But I want to let you know that the Lord wants to heal you. Hallelujah. He's saying, come to me, all you who are bruised and are heavy burdened. And I will give you rest. The Lord wants to give you rest. The Lord wants to give you rest. I don't know if there's anybody here that feels like their oxygen has been snuffed out. That there's so little oxygen in the house because there's so much tension that we can't even breathe. Daddy is so strict. He's always beating up the, the mother, the father. He, he beats up my mother. He beats up the children. And even if a cat comes near him, he kicks it. That's how angry he is. Jesus is saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you're feeling that way, this morning, I just want the church to arise. If we can all arise. And those that need prayers, those that have never received the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior, is there anybody like us that in, the, in our midst this morning? Those that have never received the Lord as their Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Is there anybody like that? You will not be able to overcome if you don't have a relationship with this God. Like David, he had a relationship with God. That's why he was able to stand and write what he wrote that we're able to meditate on right now. Is there anybody amongst us that wants to give their life to the Lord? You will not be able to overcome that depression. 
You will not be able to overcome that situation in your house if you do not have a relationship with God. I want to start with those things first. Is there anybody like that? There's, not, there's no need to be ashamed. That's the beginning point. When you develop that relationship with Jesus, is there anybody else? You might be a mother. You might be a father. You might have contributed to your children's misery. That they are coming back and hitting back at you. This morning, I just want to encourage you to raise up your hands. If you want to give your life to Jesus, is there anybody amongst us that wants to give their lives to Jesus?